engineering services contract at Community Space Center. So what that really means is that I have a contract with your uh, NASA security. So you're a rocket scientist. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I got my Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at Georgia College and State University um, in Millersville, Georgia, which is basically the middle of nowhere. Um, I graduated in May of 2012, and then immediately following, I got an internship at Kennedy Space Center, and then um, about four months later, I got a job on the engineering services contract at Kennedy Space Center. So I just would like to talk a little bit about my path. Kennedy Space Center, there's a kind of star reference. Um, so I took five sciences in the seventh grade. And I had a teacher named Miss Shiley. And she was such a great teacher that she inspired me to become a scientist. I loved science from the day that I started taking her to class. And she was just very passionate about the material. She taught it. Um, with a great deal of passion, and so many students that I knew, people that I know today, still come to her class just thought she was a great teacher and really made them start loving science. So it wasn't exactly just the material, because it was um, life sciences, and obviously I'm not focused in life sciences, but um, just the teacher. Which, um, thank you to all of you for that, because I think you guys can probably do the same for a lot of students. So um, into college, I took honors biology, uh, honors chemistry, honors physics, and honors or AP physics. So I continued on with all the science classes. And then uh, I didn't know where I wanted to go to college. I didn't want to go to the big Georgia school, UGA or Georgia Tech. Um, I was, I still am an introvert, kind of shy person. And um, so I chose to go to Georgia College because it's actually a very small public university in Georgia. And it was very small class sizes. And once again, the professors, it was very one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they pushed me, they really pushed me in the right direction. At first, I wanted to go to pharmacy school, but uh, later I decided I didn't want to do that. But, <laughs> um, so that was my original reason for going into chemistry. But, um, I, it was a, the school was a good fit for me because I was shy and because I could be alone with my teachers. So, uh, but I did have some struggles, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Because I think sometimes students, they get one bad grade or something, and they think that they can't, they can't do it. Yes, and I, that's how I felt too. You know, I started organic chemistry, which is where <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of hit or miss with organic chemistry. Uh, my, our teacher the first day was like, some people will really get it, and some people will not get it. Okay, I was one of the people who was, it was way over my head. Um, so I struggled through that class, and that was really the weeding out class, uh, kind of like you mentioned that you had one like that. We we had organic chemistry as a weeding out class, so there was 50 of us. It was textbook. Yeah, oh yeah. And it was all, you had to know all of it, whole textbook. And so, um, I think we started out with 50 students in our major, which isn't a lot, but it dropped down to 20. After that. So that was really the class where people left. So I stayed with it, um, and I'm glad I did. And my research advisor, um, who I'm still very close with today, really, she was really pushing me to keep, keep with it, even though I struggled. I did struggle a lot through the year. Um, I did a lot of extracurricular stuff with them. Uh, I was in the chemistry club and I was the secretary, and I also did something called National Chemistry Week, which is really fun. We do a lot of outreach activities for um, younger students and go to science experiments for them. And everything. So that was really great, also. So I was getting ready to graduate. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. In the back of my mind, I had always really wanted to work for NASA. Since I was an eighth grader, I was like, man, that would be a really awesome place to work. Um, so, I applied to an internship. There's, there's this um, online program, that actually, I mean, you should probably give you all the link, but they do internships at all of the centers, and you can apply to up to 15 per year. And uh, so, I applied to all 15 because I just was hoping I would get one. And then 
I did hear from them. I had a phone interview. And I was so giddy on the phone with them, kind of, you know, well, how does it feel to work for NASA? And I think that really said something to them that I was actually excited for. And I wasn't doing it just for, you know, because I needed something to do. And, um, so really showing my excitement to them, I think, really uh, helped me get the internship. And so what I'm trying to say with this is, you, even if you think there's no way, the students think, oh, there's no way. I can never, you know, get an internship. And that was my idea. There's absolutely no way I'll ever get an internship. Um, but just to stop. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my work, not too in depth about it. Um, initially, when I was hired on on the engineering services contract, I was working on a biological water project, which was basically we were trying to take uh, microbes and turn urine back into water. So uh, that was a pretty interesting um, project. Um, we also did um, an air revitalization project. Um, for uh, space station applications, and so basically we're taking a waste stream and either like carbon monoxide or some kind of ammonia in it um, and running it through like a catalyst at a higher temperature and trying to, um, I guess, turn it back into oxygen and carbon. Um, so that was also really cool. But most of my time out there, I have worked for the corrosion technology group out there. Um, so the main focus of that is on my project called Smart Cooking a little bit about today. Um, it's a lot of hands-on work, synthesis, and um, analysis via a lot of microscopic techniques. So what is corrosion? Um, corrosion is a process that occurs when a material breaks down because of a reaction with its environment. It's usually going to happen on metals, but it can happen to wood and um, other materials as well. It's very expensive. I have the cost written down. It is usually 200, or it, on average, runs $276 billion per year for the United States for corrosion related issues. Um, it can cause really dangerous situations. Um, one is the, so the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant that went down in 2010, um, they're still dealing with issues with that. It's still the reactor was still kind of out of control, and so they have to pump water into them. And they have this big tank, so they have to, the water can't go back into the ocean because it's contaminated. Well, they had, they only have like, two people who check the tanks to make sure the tanks are okay. It's a crazy amount of tanks, so they don't get to them right on time. And I guess uh, some of the seals were corroded, mm -hmm. and the water was leaking out into the ocean. So it's going to take them. I think it's going to take like 40 years to do the cleanup, and it's going to cost a million dollars. So it's very expensive, and it can be very dangerous. So, um, key chemicals that have <coughs> been used to protect against corrosion in the past have been found to be carcinogenic, cancer causing, and uh, also very dangerous to the environment as well. So, this um, this group has been working on alternatives to hexavalent chromium, which is what I was just talking about, the uh, hexavalent chromium for the years, and they actually have, I believe, the specific group that I'm in has six patents for the work, so they can get started. And the patents are on something called uh, encapsulation of the corrosion generators, which I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, and they have a very large beach exposure, exposure site for testing. It's about 500 feet long. It's right on the Atlantic coast. And it probably sees some of the most extreme corrosion conditions in the world. It's, um, it's not only corrosive because of the salt in the air and the humidity and everything, but also because the shuttles used to launch and they would produce hydrochloric acid. So there's still a lot of that there. So hexavalent chromium was the gold standard for protection of aluminum. Um, it's used all over. It's actually used um, in the DOD a lot for ships, airplanes. Um, it's not banned, 
but uh, there's like a demo out there where if you if you can get away with not using it, you shouldn't use it. Um, so, for instance, if there's a shift and it needs you know, a new color paint, they're, they're probably still going to use the material coming because there's no better alternative that will protect the ship line, which is very it's sad because it's horrible for the environment. It causes cancer, but they need a viable option to go to instead of this uh, chemical. So, um, obviously, there's a need for an alternative inhibitor, but So that's where our work comes in. Um, so it aims to protect the metal <coughs> substrate, substrates from corrosion by incorporating the corrosion inhibitors straight into the coating. But you can't just pour an inhibitor into the coating because it will react with the coating. It's not always compatible. So they've actually come up with a way to put it into these little almost spheres up there. It's actually really small. They're only, I think, one micron. So can't see it. Um, so they, they're putting inhibitors into these little spheres, and when corrosion starts, ideally, the spheres will release the inhibitor and protect it. So it's not actually preventing the corrosion from happening, it's just going to prevent it from spreading. So it, that, that would be if maybe like a scratch occurred on the metal or something. Bare, if there's any bare metal exposed, it should go in and help keep it from spreading. So, and the way that it senses it is with a, a pH change. So, when the pH change does indicative of corrosion, and that's when the uh, inhibitor should be able to uh, protect the metal. So, the corrosion group, they've been able to get really good results from using their encapsulated inhibitors. And there's actually quite a few industrial partners that they work with. Um, <laughs> anybody that needs coding, there's, you can probably name a few companies that obviously need corrosion protection. Um, so I actually do work on some stuff for some of our partners. Um, and one thing that they've just recently done is they've got, there's a, there's really two different kinds of ways to measure how well your sample is doing. So you can do atmospheric exposure, which is actually outside, like that which site that I showed you. Or you can also do um, accelerated corrosion testing, which is something <coughs> called salt foam chamber. So basically you're just hitting it with maybe a five percent salt solution for really high humidity, so it's accelerating it. And you would never really see that outside. And so they actually had a coating <coughs> on one of their samples that lasted for an entire year, which is unheard of. It's actually, so, they're doing good work. We're doing good work. We're hopefully going to find something that can replace that terrible thing we don't have. But they found replacement for the hexavalent, I mean, is it the still chromium base? Um, the replacements, no, they will not be chromium base. They are, um, a lot of them are actually biological, um, different biological things. Um, they're, the thing is, I'm trying to think of what's released and what I can actually say. Because um, <laughs> I know we have inhibitors that are, are known to inhibit corrosion. I'm, I can look that up on my phone and see what I'm saying. <laughs> and I can tell you what it is and I can tell you how it works. I'm not really sure. So, just a question. So, the inhibitors are working on the microscopic level? That's the idea. So they're, yes, they're, they're small. They don't. You can't. So when you mix them into the coating, so basically, I had the picture of the little, um, the, the micron size. So they're just one micron, so it's just a little bigger than one nanometer. And um, they they have to be able to go nicely into the coating. So they become a free flowing powder. Like there was a photo to the right that was of powders. And so they go um, into the coating. Hopefully, don't react because some of them still do react. That's, I mean, that's my part of the to see if they still react um, with the So, yeah, it's a very small, very, very small, and should hopefully not affect the actual coating that's made by a coating manufacturer. We're not making them coatings, we're just making an additive that will hopefully prevent coating. Okay, so I have a little demo to do. Um, 
Um, it's kind of a basic demo. It's a uh, homemade battery, which I'm sure people have seen and maybe have done with more awesome settings. So basically, I have aluminum, which is um, it's just a perfect not for the can. Um, and I have some copper tape. So my aluminum is my anode, which is actually and then I've got my copper, which is the cathode, which is not a positive charge. And then I've got water. Okay, sorry. I need to have water for So I have water and then I have salt. I have some water to make my electrolyte solution. And the electrolyte solution is where um, my electrons will go through. I actually have a little. You pre-measured this, I assume. I did. It was like two tablespoons. I don't have a. I don't know what percentage it actually is, but you just need enough to. Um, two tablespoons. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think the percentage really matters that much. Really, just. Really, 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 Things that I have realized, um, there's a lot of 
of different stuff to do in the schedule, obviously. I'm sure that everybody knows that. But, I mean, if you don't, if you don't like history, then you know, like science is like engineering. I like so many engineers. I work with all of them. I don't want to know my scientists there. So, um, <coughs> there's something for everyone, and I think that students sometimes just give up and they don't want to learn the subject. There and a lot of different things to do, and um, the STEM field could be for them. They just don't think they should be part of it. Um, and so maybe I think for me, hands-on learning has always been a big deal for me. Actually, going and doing something <coughs> teaches me better than sitting in the classroom. Like I know lectures. I can tell you that when I was in college, I made straight A's in my lab class. I was very good at hands on things, but um, not as well in the lectures. <laughs> but um, I think it's important that you know, you're not just sitting at a desk all day and not actually seeing things in action. Because I think sometimes seeing things in action can really spark interest. Um, and I think the most important thing for me, and I've already touched on this, is that if you get one bad grade, that's it's not me. You know, you can you can work harder, you can try a different style of studying, or you know, you can still do it. One bad grade shouldn't decide the whole future. And I know students, and it was me. I mean, I was like that. You know, when I was in high school, I was taking AP calculus, and my first test. <coughs> And I thought I was going to get into college, and I thought, I mean, I've been all I was very concerned with that, and I think that you no know, one that probably the world is probably very good. Uh, oh, yeah, but I wanted to say thank you to all of you for teaching um, the students, and I hope that uh, this is somewhat helpful, and I hope that if you Feel free to ask. I can, I can answer stuff. Um, it doesn't have to.